Hi everyone, I'm Roshni from Systems Change Alliance and today I'm here with Peter Armstrong who has a lifetime of experience in filmmaking. I'm going to tell you all about him. So Peter was a senior figure in British broadcasting and global new media. He, global new media. He's been, he has been for a long time. <laughs> Peter worked at the BBC for 20 years as a producer and head of department, he founded several path-breaking series in the area of development and human values, including Everyman and Global Report, which won the United Nations Association Peace Prize. In 1983, he started and produced the Doomsday Project, the first multimedia initiative of the BBC, involving a million citizens in creating an interactive record of Great Britain. Later, he became director of network television for the BBC Southeast region. And in 1986, he founded BBC Interactive. He left the BBC to become a founding director of Word Pictures, an independent media and television production company, and chairman of the Multimedia Corporation, which he floated as a public company. In 1995, with Anuradha Vitachi, he launched One World, which pioneered the new media opportunities of the internet to promote global justice in the nonprofit sector. It grew into a portal bringing together 3,400 partner NGO websites worldwide and pioneering with One World Radio, One World TV and One Climate. In 2004, the British Academy for Film and Television Arts awarded him the BAFTA Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in interactive multimedia. In 2013, he co-founded with Anuradha the Hedgeley Wood Trust, a charity set up in memory of their daughter, Boo Armstrong, and dedicated to continuing her passion for the health of the planet and its people. It works under the banner of Empathy Media, and its latest projects can be seen at empathymedia.org, aiming to combine the power of empathy and the power of media to help bring about a fairer, greener world. This year, 2020, he has published Not For Nothing, the book that this book looks back on his lifelong struggle with the ultimate questions of the meaning of life. No small topic there. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and wow, what a, what a personal history to look back upon. How did you get into making films, Peter? Well, I really thank my grandfather for that because he was mad on filmmaking in the 1930s. And when he died, I inherited his uh, 60 millimeter camera, which is a wonderful thing. You had to you wind it up to actually, you have to wind it, it doesn't even work now. Oh, yes, it does. You wind it up to uh, you know, take a few feet of film and you wind it up again. One shot, another shot, no sound, of course. Very, very primitive, but to me, completely thrilling. And I started when I was 12, making films with this. And of course, I could only shoot tiny little bits of film, quite expensive. I had to source little offcuts of um, what are called short ends of professional films that people sometimes sell and then try and develop them at home and make them into something and of course what you make them into no one can ever really watch because it's only short you've got no distribution so it was just purely amateur but I kind of kept doing it so when I was at school I was still making films when I was at college instead of doing everything I should have been doing I was also making a lot of films and then eventually I was sending these films all to the BBC and saying, you know, please, I would like to do this. And um, basically they said, well, obviously your films are no good. So what about a job in radio <laughs> for six weeks? So that's what I did. And I joined the six week contract and stayed, as you said, for, for 20 years. And that was a huge privilege. And of course, then you have the power to make documentaries that have an audience. And in those days, it was much, much, much freer than it is now. So the controllers would tend to say, well, what would you like to make next? And you say, well, I'm really interested in such and such. And then you had a year to explore that with all the resources, the BBC and graphics and film cameras and editing and all the rest. Real privilege and, you know, learnt, of course, everything. And then my life really changed very dramatically on one day um, when I was the head of department and we were at a film festival in Montreux and all kinds of awards and grand things. Uh, then I watched on, in a side viewing a little film, didn't win any awards, um, about this bishop of Recife in a very poor parish in northern Brazil called Don Helder Camera. 
and I was just con totally inspired by what he had to say about the real problems of the world in terms of the majority world and the poverty and the injustice that they were facing. And you know, he very famously said, uh, if I talk about um, supporting the poor, they call me a saint. But as soon as I ask why are they poor, they call me a communist. And so I, that was completely inspiring to me. And I wandered around in Montreal wondering what on earth to do. And I went back to the festival and said to my boss, I'm resigning and I'm just going to only focus on this subject because I think it's the most important. And, and that's, so that was a complete turning point. And the next film we made was called Global Report, which was trying to look reflect that really, because every year the BBC did an end of the year two hour special on what's happened in the year. But of course, what happened is that view was what happened politically, what happened to the big names, the celebrities, the news items you'd already knew about. It was nothing to do with what really happened to the majority of the, the world's people, the world's environment and so on. So we had a two, alternate, two hour alternative called Global Report. And that's when I first actually went right out with supported by a wonderful editor of New Internationalist magazine called Peter Adamson. He sort of taught me the business, as it were, about what's going on in the world, seeing it through a different pair of eyes, not the official media view of what's important, but what's actually happening. And we filmed with real people around the world and it was completely inspiring land invasions in Honduras and up in the Arctic, people protesting against what was happening to the Arctic even then in 1981. So that was, um, that's really how I got into documentaries and it's been, uh, it's been uh, good. A good thing to do, I think. <laughs> so that was that was a shift from working in other types of film and then moving into documentaries, but staying within the BBC. Is that right initially? Yes, that's right. And then I, I left the BBC because of the rise of multimedia. It just seemed to me that there was a whole new thing happening in the eighties. My son and I started working with black, very simple BBC micros when we did this thing called the Doomsday Project. And then I thought, well, this is a really an opportunity for NGOs to actually use a new medium that was just arriving called the Internet um, to get messages out in a much more interactive way. It's no longer like, here's the message in the documentary, I'll tell you. It's here's information. What do you say? What do you think? Let's share it. Here's how you can interact. Here's how you can learn more. You want to dive deeper into this bit? You can skip over that bit. So, you know, a better form of multi-way communication it seemed to us. And in the early days of the internet, we were very idealistic and romantic and thought it would be, you know, the answer. We started this thing called One World, as, as you mentioned, and linked up with, you know, the, the great NGOs working in these fields. And it was a real privilege to work to work with them. Um, so yeah, I did that. And then I went, we then started doing independent films as well, back to documentaries, but in a rather different way. And, um, you know, most recently, just to contrast with what I was showing about my grandfather's camera, I'm now back to simplicity again because my latest films, more and more, I just use the iPhone uh, with a little rifle mic and quite honestly, it can do nine tenths of what we used to do with a four man crew. No, it's exaggerated, you can't, you can't. But you can get as much impact if it's used as many, many people are powerfully. And a situation of, you know, a protest with police and people being arrested it's inconspicuous, it's, it's the perfect tool. And of course, it's completely, I won't say it's free because you've got to have a bit of gear, but it's virtually free compared with a film camera in the old days where even 10 minutes of filming cost you 200 pounds. You had to really think. I mean, this interview we've done already would have cost 200. We better think about stopping. Um, so uh, yeah, documentary film has, has come a huge way. And now, of course, it's moved it's moved out of the big institutions, which is the other big exciting thing. It's no longer, you know, I had an uphill battle with the BBC. When we left and we were independent producers, I had a complete battle with the BBC and I had a fight actually with the Director General saying, look, climate change, climate change, you're not doing it. You're still putting on, you know, climate deniers. You're not really covering it. This is the most important thing. Where are you? And he said, oh, well, we did something, we did something. And um, when we tried to offer things to the BBC as an independent, they said, oh, well, we've done a film on that. We've done sustainability, thank you very much. But thank goodness, all the independent filmmakers now, with the access they've got via the internet and YouTube and at conferences and festivals and you know small meetings of activists, they're carrying the flag. And thank goodness, now I think the message is beginning to actually get out to the public that there is something 
hugely important and even existential here. So would you say that is um, one of the big shifts over your career is this disability for the people, the common people to be actually making the media and the bigger institutions to be losing their grip on the... Absolutely. The big institutions field. are still there. I thought they wouldn't be, actually. I was surprised the BBC is, is still there because I thought television would have to be interactive, which it sort of has become with YouTube and so on. And it would have to become non-linear as it has with YouTube and Netflix and people would choose more. And I didn't think the BBC would have much place, but it has kept a sort of a place. I'm continuing to be disappointed in, in many, many ways. Um, so, but the exciting thing I think is the alternative ecology, the fact that um, you know everybody with simple equipment, there's no barrier to entry. That was the thing. When I was growing up, I couldn't join the global conversation at all there's no way i make a bit of film i started a little tiny company as a teenager called no not a teenager my 20s called apocalypse films and we used to send out huge reels of 60 millimeter film to a few interesting parties and probably you know i could count on the fingers of one hand how many people actually watch them um, and even at the bbc a good film on bbc2 was two million um, now independent films can go way way better than that and some of our little films on on empathy media have hit four million. Um, you know, and all, I wish it was all the time, but you know, sometimes. So it's a different barrier to entry, which thank goodness has changed. And um, I think the big institutions are going to have to catch up, quite honestly. And um, but we don't need to wait for them; we need to get on with it. And what what would you say is the most challenging thing these days with making films and getting them out into the, the public eye? I think it's what to say. Um, I think we've now got, we've had a lot of documentaries in the last 10 years saying there is a climate crisis. And there have been very good ones. And you know, my daughter Franny Armstrong has made a wonderful film um, called The Age of Stupid that had a huge following and led to a whole movement. And a lot of films have made a difference. And it's sort of there in the public consciousness now. People are aware, oh, there is this thing. Forget about climate deniers. There is a thing called climate. Uh, crisis, climate emergency, we've got to do something about it. There's a bio um, diversity crisis as well. We've got to do something about it. We've got, we've heard there are some vague plans about zero by 2050, but maybe that solved it. But where do we go beyond that? We've, we've got the message out there now with all, with all these documentaries, I think, and all kinds of other conferences and what have you, that there is a crisis. But now, so what's the next message we have to get out? And that's really what I've been struggling with and my friends have been struggling with. Um, and, you know, you mentioned, or maybe you haven't mentioned this, my latest quite big film called The Sequel, um, which is really about that, is what comes next? Um, and um, do we, are we stuck in a binary choice between pessimism, or what you might call realism, which is it's going to be absolutely terrible, or do we jump to a more optimistic hope-filled vision which you could say is too hopeless but you know too uh, um, airy-fairy that it'll all be all right because technology will save us clearly we can't do either of those exactly but we've got to find some combination of telling the truth about the situation which is also empowering and how to do that and what the message should be uh, i think is the, is the challenge now i don't think it's as easy as saying oh, this is the answer, or it's all hopeless. It's got to be something else. So you mentioned there, yes, your film, The Sequel, um, which is a, a film based around the work of David Fleming. Um, what did you learn or what, what inspired you most about David Fleming's work as you, through that project? Um, a tremendous amount. I mean, I, I was at college sort of at the same time as David, but and I only ever met him once, which was very good to do. Then he died in nineteen in uh, 2010. Uh, and so I was reintroduced to him completely by the person who put his works together. David spent his whole life writing this huge book called Lean Logic, an absolutely massive tome, and he never finished it. It was never published. So it was left to Sean Chamberlain to edit it later, and as now he's been promoting it around the world. And he came to me with the idea of the film, and I worked with him. 
So I learned everything through him and through this wonderful book. And it's very hard to summarize, but David does have an answer which is between those two poles I mentioned. Because what David says is, there is going to be a crash. It's not a question of a transition that we're going to gradually improve things and get a few more electric cars and a few more wind turbines and uh, we can go on consuming in just the same way. It's not going to be a gentle transition to carry on with business as usual. It ain't going to work. In his view, for thousands of reasons that he lays out, um, there's going to be a crash. And the biggest simple reason is because, as he says, and a lot of people agree, I think, there's a basic contradiction in Western civilization, if you like, Western neoliberalism, which is we ex it depends on continual growth, and that's continual growth in a finite planet. So the only way for our culture, our civilization, our economy to continue, in his view, and it feels right to me, I'm not an economist, he was, is to keep growing. Uh, that's the only way. If you stop growing, then you get unemployment, all the investments collapse. Um, you can't have capitalism without growth. But if you do keep growing on a finite planet, then you're using up resources, you're, you're wrecking the planet. You're, it's going to be a complete disaster in the way everybody, I think, understands. So he believed, actually, there is no way out of that. There is going to be a crash. So all we can do now is prepare for the time afterwards. So that's what he said. We've got to rediscover those ways of living, those ways of economy, those ways of society and community, which worked in the past before this industrial revolution and the consumer society hit us, um, which depends on the informal, uh, informal economy, trusting each other, depending on each other in small communities, local food, local energy, um, local everything. Um, and if we can start building that now, then when the crash comes, uh, we'll be kind of prepared. And that sounds sort of very idealistic in a way and a little bit um, fanciful maybe. So when we started the film, we said, well, who is actually following this? Who is actually trying to do it? And then when we went out into the, around the world looking for people, that was really inspiring because they were really doing it. And just to give you a couple of examples, um, he talks a lot about community celebration and recovering the sense of joy and carnival that comes in community, as opposed to the grind of hard work and life that isn't worth really enjoying. And so we filmed a wonderful group in, in uh, South London who took over an area of the, the centre of town where the buses were always turning and turned it into a village green. They stopped the buses by agreement, the buses didn't come in. They brought in all the, uh, the greenery of a village green, invited everybody came in. There was music, there was you know, dancing, there was festival, there was wonderful food and drink and stories. And suddenly you could see that in the middle of the busiest part of, um, of South London, um, Tooting, uh, you could recreate just for a day and get a vision of what it could be like, what our cities could be like if we could get back to a greening. And of course, with COVID now, people are beginning to see that. Why do streets have to be packed with parked cars and endless traffic? Wouldn't it be nice to have some green spaces where children can play in? Yes, we could do it. Why not? And so people are doing it. And then another example we were found very inspiring was um, meeting Rob Hopkins, who, who worked with David, and they, they, they worked together on these issues. And Rob founded these tran the Transition Towns movement, and he's about putting into practice or right around the world exactly the same principles. What happens if communities come together for the things that, that you know really, really matter? Um, you know, for example, another example from the film, and a good alternative to the consumer society buying more and more and then throwing it away and filling up landfill and causing all the problems and that, that implies is repairing things, making things that are durable and that can then be repaired. And so we filmed in a, in a repair cafe, which was quite new. I, I had never heard of it when I went there into a repair cafe in Stroud, marvellous people repairing things. But now, a couple of years later, there's two actually in the villages near here and they are springing up. So it's not just an idealistic kind of hopeless visionary thing, actually getting back to an informal community based ecology uh, and economy, small scale at the moment, but it could be what we depend on if there really is the kind of crash that, that David imagined. Yeah, it's um, 
it's a sobering thought, but I think sometimes it is crisis that forces us to actually find new ways of living, you know, that we just can't be pushed into that uncomfortable place of yeah. making that cultural shift unless the ground beneath our feet is really, you know, <laughs> splitting open. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was another, and, sorry. Go, mm, go ahead. I was going to say there's another example in the film of exactly that. We we want to say, well, let's, is there somewhere in the world that's actually already got to this point? It's already had the crisis and they're trying to, and they've reacted. And we thought, yes, of course, in Greece, that's exactly what happened. In Greece in 2009, after the financial crash, their GDP stopped growing. It actually went negative, huge unemployment, businesses closing, great return of poverty, even to middle class families and a big hit on the health service it couldn't provide the, what it had provided in the past and we went to film there what had happened and what we found was and uh, we'd been told obviously ahead of that we didn't find it we were told uh, what we filmed was this amazing solidarity movement the doctors had said well we can't let patients die pharmacists said we can't let them not have drugs because it's all suddenly gone commercial and everybody's very very poor the national health service is collapsing so they set up these solidarity clinics. Doctors came in. I think the one we filmed in had 70 doctors volunteering in their free time. Pharmacists coming in to do all the kind of drug dispensation or dispersion, whatever the word is, um, in their spare time or people who were retired. And the whole thing working marvelously. People were coming in, no money changed hands. And that's just a little glimpse of what could happen after what David saw as the climacteric, he called it, the collapse that's coming. Yes, it's like the prioritization of relationships over, yeah, commercial growth or, um, yeah, and that, that's what struck me about the film is this, this offering of, um, you know, because we, the big shift that's taken place for me over this last couple of years is, is realizing that economics is not just something that they do in Wall Street or, you know, it's not just graphs and statistics, it's it's the everyday exchanges that human beings are doing, carrying out with each other and and with the natural resources, you know, that are, create the very life base that we rely on, um, that we're part of. Um, but so what I see he's talking about is that David Fleming talks about this, this rising from just local communities um, to a different way of, of living and interacting with one another. And at the same time, you know, you mentioned growth capitalism and that's kind of like the overarching, the big picture stuff that's the, the kind of global picture of what's driving our whole machine in a way from the top side. Um, how do you see these these uh, changes interacting with one another, because I see that in the alternative world, you know, everyone is talking about post-growth, degrowth, you know, limiting growth. Um, and at the same time, it's about localization. I mean, where do, do you have any sense of where these two kind of worlds meet in the middle or? Well, I wouldn't put it quite the same way. I think degrowth fits very well with localization. What doesn't fit well, and which is a real problem for me, I do not know the answer and I'd like to know what you think, is that we still need an international perspective. Um, you know, we couldn't solve COVID in the little villages around here as a lovely community growing our own food with our own energy. If the virus had come in, we actually couldn't have solved it. Uh, we need, and nor could Britain have solved it on its own. Uh, we needed actually interna an international um, feeling of shared interest and shared skills and a, a global um, joint effort. So I'm really puzzled as to how we combine that local, because we're against globalization in its negative way, <laughs> I can see that. But there's a form of internationalism which surely we still need, and with climate change it's exactly the same. It's absolutely no good. if you know, let's suppose by a miracle Britain achieved net zero by 2030 and uh, then obviously we you know it needs everyone else to do it and if America doesn't then um, etc so 
I don't know what the difference is. And some people say, well, we need an international perspective for certain things and we need a local perspective for other things. Um, but I don't really see how that works because you know, the values you need for each are a little bit different and the politics you need for each is different. So do we, as you know, I'm talking about myself now, and we work in a thing called the Climate Action Network, which is a very small group of a few score people in the villages around here. Um, and we sometimes try and have some impact on the local council. We have no impact on the central government. Um, and we obviously no impact on the international order. Um, so how David's world impinges with that world, I don't know. I mean, years ago, we used to go as an NGO to Davos, and that was a pretty terrifying experience to see the kind of captains of the, of the world um, deciding all our futures. Um, and there was, you know, we were kind of there on sufferance with a few other NGOs, and um, they listened politely, and I think completely ignored, and this was, you know, a decade ago, completely ignored what we were saying. And obviously capitalism goes its own way and growth goes its own way. So how you influence that as activists or as documentary makers or the work you're doing uh, with the Alliance, uh, I do not know. Um, and I guess we'll come on to that in a minute when we come to more radical suggestions. But to me, that is the big challenge. Uh, it's no longer enough to make, if I make the next documentary or other great, you know, better documentaries than me, make the next one which is about this is the climate crisis i don't think that's i don't think that's going to be that helpful we need more amount we need artists or poets or documentary makers or singers or visionary people to come up with some kind of image some kind of a vision of of what next and how to inspire everybody to, to see yes that's where we want to get to and as i think you were hinting COVID has given us a clue to that because, you know, COVID has said, well, you know, we've been locked in here. So things like walking in the woods, things like playing the piano, things like, as you say, relationships with friends, reading, none of these are high cost, expensive, exploitative things to do. And yet they're extremely satisfying. So rediscovering those kind of joys, that needs to be somehow conveyed, I won't be able to do it, but all of us need to think how. We've got a, another tiny little project called Mosaic Earth, We the Planet, in which people mm. send, um, send their messages of love to the planet, what I really care about, planet Earth. And this is what I care about, it's my grandchildren, this is what I care about, it's these animals and um, my care, you know, the dog I live with or whatever, um, and it builds up. And so it's something like that, that we need to do to for everyone to feel a the importance and the centrality to their own lives of this beautiful planet and what we're doing to it harming it and what we could be doing to live in it in a harmonious and um, balanced and uh, sustainable way. Yes, it's a uh, that's a balance to be struck around keeping it real and and acknowledging the challenges we're facing and yet not getting totally um paralyzed by the doom and gloom of it and being able to still tell the stories of what it is we want to create together yeah 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 so those examples um in the sequel of those local communities that are actually doing something you know it's that feeling of yes I can actually have agency in my own community even if the global picture is so overwhelming to take yeah. in but yeah so moving on to another short film of yours Sacred Duty to Rebel um, you look in that one at the involvement of Christian groups and priests in the Extinction Rebellion movement what does sacred activism mean to you? Um, I hope I don't just look at Extinction Rebellion, I'm part of it. I'm, that's an inside view. I'm part of this group called Christian Climate Action and I really support 
um, what those rebels have been doing and all the rebels have been doing around the world. It is that serious and they have woken people up. You know, it's, it's Greta on the one hand and the school strikes and it's Extinction Rebellion on the other, which I think have kind of broken through the slightly comfortable media account of climate change to say, look, this is a different, it's a different order of urgency. We're talking about extinction here. We're talking about, as Greta would say, a house on fire. It's an emergency. What are we going to do? Not just talk about it, have another conference. So that film came out of being part of it. And it wasn't decided, it wasn't going to be a film at all. It's just, I think <laughs> I mentioned this thing, I just always have it with me. So when we were on the streets and people were being arrested, um, then I found I was filming and other people were filming as well. And um, and so it kind of, I just thought, well, let's put it together and see, if, try and convey what why these people are prepared to um, sac make this kind of sacrifice. And as you say, many of them are priests. And I was very, very touched by that because so many, you know, I have so much concern, <laughs> as much concern about the church as I do the BBC, I think. Um, and I'm so disappointed in the reaction of the church to the crisis we're in. But there are some priests, you know, there's a woman who is in that film, who's in her 70s, she walks with a stick. Every time we've had an action in, in London, she's come up from the West Country on a coach in the very, very early morning, joined in the thing completely, been, know she would be arrested, been arrested, carted off by the police, put in a police cell overnight, maybe two nights, released, back on the coach, back home. And, you know, that's the degree of commitment. And there's, of course, thousands of people doing doing similar things that I found so, so inspiring because we'll come on to the kind of uh, spiritual side of all this because, but I think it's not too much to say that if you're involving the faith community, they have exactly the same motivation as, as everyone, as all of us, that, you know, we're wrecking our planet home, we must stop wrecking it. But they also have a bit of extra motivation that we, they believe, we believe that humans are created as part of a whole system which involves the animals and the earth and the biosystem and indeed the whole planet. And so it's, it's not just something to be Toy, oh, it's convenient to trash it, or it's not convenient, or it's an economic um, tragedy, or it's a bit of a pity if we all our children die. It's even more than that. It's a it's a cosmic tragedy, really, because it all is so beautiful and is meant to be so beautiful. And so it it hits the hearts more, I think, of people who come from those kind of religious stories as a background, and also I think they've been able to bring their rituals to the streets and which is to me a very very interesting thing because what do you do if you protest um you know you can shout you can hold banners you can have petitions but increasingly i think the kind of symbolic actions that take place um like the die-ins you know being part of a die -in, or where you spread blood blood in front of one of the ministries spray blood on a building or when you have the wonderful red um red rebels all these kind of symbolic actions that express, not in words, not in shouting, but in some deep, deeper form of ritual, ritualized sending of a message that gets through to people. And that's what the church, the business of church has been in. And its rituals now feel, feel rather out of touch and they're tucked away in churches. But if they were out in the street, as we done, we've done with some of them in, in the film, uh, you know, for example, the Ash Wednesday, ritual in church you put ashes on the forehead and say you know we're all made of dust and we're returning to dust and it's about realizing our fragility so putting that onto the street and actually putting oil onto our foreheads instead of dust and saying you know we're part of a, a global tragedy that has to change and so i'm a great believer in street liturgy if you like or street ritual um and so that was part of the film as well that we could um show some of that um, and it brings to me brings to life rituals which in a church can seem very tired and not very relevant into an extreme relevance on the streets so that's what that film was about and um, um, thank goodness for 
thank goodness for Extinction Rebellion, thank goodness for the people who are prepared to really put their lives, you know, not their full lives on the line here, but in other countries, yes, their full lives on the line for protecting the Amazon rainforest or whatever it might be, you know. Um, and thank goodness for Greta's just showing a complete adult world what it means to um, take something seriously and take action on it and be committed 100%. And this um, this uh, theme of your life and your work and your personal life around um, spirituality has been uh, the foundation of this book that you've published this year. Is that right? Yes, it's just a little, you know, I think when you get older, you tend to want to write a memoir. I don't quite know why. And I don't know if anyone will read it. Maybe the grandchildren will read it or maybe you do it in order to try and find yourself what actually you do believe in or anything and so it's about it's called searching for a meaningful life not for nothing and so the question is as you get older is it all for nothing you know have I I done all this gave that list of stuff I've done well does it add up to anything <laughs> is it all being for nothing you know I made a film in 1981 so what um, what does our life add up to what's what really matters um, and then rather grandly putting that into a cosmic framework again. So saying, does anything matter? Um, you know, what is the meaning of life, the universe and everything? Um, and the answer is, we don't know, of course. We look out at the cosmos. Uh, but there are only two choices. Either it means absolutely nothing, which is fine. That's a secular scientific view. And that's essentially the view of existentialism, which I think is the alternative to my view, is the existentialist view. Life is basically absurd. There is no point to it. The universe is pointless. It's come into existence for no reason. It continues for no reason. Uh, any reason my life might have is only something which I, I will have to create because there is nothing out there that gives any meaning. Life is the theatre of the absurd. And I will heroically live in the theatre of the absurd. And, you know, uh, or, so that's one alternative, not based on knowledge or facts or evidence, it's just based on a reaction to what we see as life. Or the other one is, no, it must have some meaning. It's too big, it's too beautiful. Uh, I feel part of something. It feels it's all connected. It feels as if it's all going somewhere. You know, traditionally people in the past, like Bernard Shaw, called it a life force or the power of evolution or something. You know, It feels there's some meaning there and that, therefore my life, if my life is part of that, my life has more meaning. So... None of this is dogmatic, none of this is certain, none of this is something I know or I'm going to persuade you or anyone else of. I don't want to. It's just something you have to personally make a choice choice about. So I call myself an agnostic because I don't know which of those is true. But I do call myself a religious agnostic because I think I've, my, I've taken a choice that I've, I've chosen to believe there is a meaning. And we're all here. It's not for nothing. So that's what the book is about, really, and um, it's about discovering, I suppose, what's worth, you, you were mentioning it earlier, what's worth living for. When I did a very brief spell as a university lecturer teaching ethics, you know, I used to ask a very, very simple question, well, what actually is worth, worth anything in your life? Um, and when you, what's actually worth doing on an average day? And it doesn't tend to be work. It doesn't tend to be, unless it's a very personal you know, kind of work that you're doing for your own expression. It tends to be something artistic. It tends to be personal relationships. It tends to be music. It tends to be living in nature. Um, these are the things that really all of us actually find matter. Um, so at the end of the day, you do need to think of a philosophy. You need to, if you're going to try and summarize your philosophy in a little book, which is I say, what I've done with this book called Not For Nothing, um, then you have to finally say, well, what are the things that you know ultimately matter for humans? And if those are the things, well, let's spend our time doing that. And the artistic one for me happens to be making films. Uh, so that's where I can find meaning. And when I have ideas I want to express, thank goodness, now there's no barrier. That's where we started off early on the barrier to entry now. 
if you following our conversation i think oh i'd love to do a little piece about that there's no great cost i've got the you know it doesn't cost anything to shoot with this equipment i can film around here i can ask a few friends i can put it on the internet so the barrier to entry for my particular art form thank goodness uh, has hugely changed unless you want to do a netflix special of course it's a bit different <laughs> Yeah, that's that's beautiful to see how you know how your your creative work as a filmmaker has has enabled you to to find that meaning in your own life. I mean, it certainly seems that you made conscious choices about the kind of films you wanted to be making and the kind of um, awareness that you wanted to be raising through those films, which seems very meaningful, you know, compared to the amount of um, pseudo cultural material we have floating around our <laughs> world generally. So yeah. to yeah, but to it's a huge privilege. Do. I mean, it's a huge yeah. privilege. I mean, I, it's it's. I wish that could be for everyone, and not only in the rich world but in the global south as well. Everyone could have that privilege. I'm I'm well aware it's a completely privileged situation, but if you can get to that, even in simple ways, maybe you know, if I was did wood carving. And I live, you know, one of our friends here lives very, very simply in the woods and does take pleasure in much, much simpler things than fancy, you know, filmmaking. So I guess there are ways in which all of us can find the simple forms of expression that give meaning to what we do. Um, I, I hope so. <laughs> um, when, uh, but if we go back to documentary making, when I first joined television, I was given advice by a very good senior person who said, okay, you're starting the beginning, you'll be asked to do all sorts of stuff, you've got to learn the business. Your aim is to get to the point where they say to you, what would you like to make next? I thought that was really, really good. And so if people, and then of course, I couldn't always do that in the BBC, but outside the BBC, I can. And once financially it becomes possible, now I can get to that. And so whatever form of artistic expression or journalism or anything else one's in, if you can, if we can get to that point of, yes, this is what I need to do next for me and what seems important, uh, then um, that seems, you know, the kind of freedom that, you know, we need to find and the kind of fulfillment. It's about fulfillment endlessly, eventually, isn't it? And yet perhaps with this rise in citizen journalism, everyone can just say, this is what I want to do next and go out and do it if they have the basic equipment. Yeah. Um, what what's what's happening next for you creatively? Um, I don't know. Um, we are doing a project. Um, well, I do know actually. <laughs> I say that projects just tend to kind of arrive, um, and we, so the next thing is going to be in the middle of next year. We're working. My daughter and I have been thinking a lot about the question I raised because she's a much better filmmaker than me. And this question of, you know, what's next? And we've done a number of films on Zoom this this year called The Flip, which was looking at bringing people to look at uh, what comes next. What does it mean to build back better and post-COVID and all the rest of it? And that was very good. But then we both felt with you know, due deference to you, we're a bit fed up with Zoom based documentaries. I mean, this is a conversation. Maybe that's OK. But just another doom based documentary didn't seem that exciting. So we thought, well, maybe if we made it an investigative documentary and it was live, that would be different. So we're doing a live documentary next May about the state of rivers in Britain, which is terrible. I've learned I knew nothing about it, but George Monbiot, who's leading this with Franny, has been uh, teaching us a number of other really wonderful people just how absolutely appalling what's happening to our rivers as a result of agriculture and as a report as a result of uh, all kinds of other chemical uh, despoiling of our, our waterways so what we're going to do is we're going to have lots of people out there with their camera phones back to this nothing more than that um, live as reporters all over the country live and we'll link it i'll do it from here we've got various bits of equipment here so i'll do the kind of live pull together from here um, and we'll try and investigate why this is happening to our rivers, what can be done about it, confront the people, see, the, see it in action, people doing, you know, measuring what's happening to rivers, talking about their love for rivers, whatever. 
but all as alive, completely participative with everybody, and obviously equally people watching, because it's live will also be participating. So I'm quite nervous, because it could all go very, very wrong, but that is actually the next thing we're doing. And it was also crowdfunded, which is another new thing, of course, which is which is lovely. I mean, Franny just who's great at these things, just, you know, launched, here's a great idea, anybody want to support it? People have, and so that's enough now to get people, to, you know, these six or more reporters around the place to actually be able to drive around or train around or cycle around to the rivers, and um, we'll see how it goes. Great. It's interesting you bring up the rivers, because I was just having a conversation with someone yesterday about um, an association in France that's doing some work around the, the Loire River and the Loire Valley, um, trying to get existential rights for the river itself. Mm. And they are doing a creative project, inviting people to create art and writing around, you know, their feelings around the river and then, and then using that to support the, I suppose, the, the legal efforts to, to attain rights for it as a, yeah, as an entity in itself. So, Roshni, can you send me the details of that? Because I got oh, a feeling oh, yes, we'll I'll get them for you, yes. we'd love to yeah. include those. We thought it was UK, but now suddenly it could be the Loire. And, uh, and, and it fits perfectly because the title of, the, of this live documentary is Ecoside. I beg your pardon, mm -hmm. Riverside. Based on okay, Ecoside. okay. Um, Riverside. Riverside. Yes, difficult to say. Um, so, it fits exactly with what they're doing. I'd love to know more about that, yes. And, We'll see what happens. Yes, and it sounds like there's a uh, an increasing reality that the UN will pass this these laws against ecocide, or, or the, even that yeah. it's in the process of happening right now. So mm. hopefully, some legislation that can actually bring some lasting change around these issues. Yeah. Um, what what's been the biggest lesson you've learned from your life and work as a filmmaker? Um, well, can I answer a different question first? Sure. <laughs> I think um, the questions I haven't answered, the, the challenges I've still got because if I say this is what I've learned, then it's like, you know, tick. Whereas what I actually feel at the moment is I've not learned some absolutely crucial things. And I've been hinting at them as we've gone along. Um, and the first one is about media. You know, I'm in the media business. I'm a media kid. I always have been. And yet media is a huge part of the climate problem. It always has been, obviously, in the last decade. And now, um, you know, you look at Murdoch, you look at Fox News. Um, you have a whole swathes of society being basically indoctrinated in given completely false sense of what is happening in the world and what is important and what can be done. And as long as that's the case, um, then, you know, whatever activists may try and do, politicians may try and do, politicians depend on the votes and carrying the will of the people in theory. Um, the media is a huge block at the moment in this country with such right-wing media ownership. Um, you know, just look at the way that uh, Jeremy Corbyn, with a, an idealistic manifesto that was very popular with people, it was fully costed and cost a great deal less than the Tories are now spending cheerfully, and not cheerfully, but as if it's not a problem to spend huge sums of money, how he was completely demonised and his chances in the election were destroyed just by the Murdoch papers. Uh, endlessly, day after day, lying. Um, so there's something there that I think we've really, really got to deal with and as a society, and I, I don't know the answer. And, um, and it's the same with social media, you know, how Trump can have got 70 million Americans to believe that there's no climate crisis, that COVID is a hoax, that he won the election. Actually believe it and go on the streets to fight for it. I mean, it is terrifying that that should be the case and this medium of things like Twitter that we all believed in so much as idealists is now open to that kind of kind of misuse and I don't know again what the answer is but that to me that until we solve that we're going to have this dreadful 
sense of not living in a world of truth. So I'm thinking a lot about truth at the moment in my philosophical moments. Um, people say we're in a post-truth world. In a courtroom, why do you have to swear? It's not just you'll tell the truth, but you'll tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And if you don't do that, you're in serious trouble. It's called perjury and you're sent to prison or whatever. So truth is taken very, very seriously in that context. In politics, it's not taken seriously at all. And, but politics at the moment, say in Britain particularly, depends on half-truth. It depends on spin. It depends on, well, a little bit of truth here, sort of, this is partly true and I'll change my mind tomorrow. And No, sorry, Mr Prime Minister, please tell us the whole truth and nothing but the truth about the implications of Brexit or what your plans are for the COVID or how what you really think about the BAME community or what you really think about racism. Um, please let's have the whole truth and let's have it strongly communicated to the society so that we can all live in the same reality and make some kind of logical, <laughs> empathetic, loving decisions as a society. But as long as we're living in different worlds with different versions of the truth, I don't see the way out of that. So those to me are the not what I've learned, what I've learned as the problems rather than learned as the solutions. Um, I think if you want a solution, what I've learned is just really about the focus and wonderfulness of individual people. That, you know, one person who has a gift, comparatively small maybe or great, not necessarily a genius or anything else, but who has a gift and really focuses on developing it, trusting it, employing it for the greater good which can just do wonderful things and you know there is no better example than Greta she is my hero she's my Joan of Arc she's you know the the individual of our times and she is the example of of what an individual can do if they focus if they believe if they're committed and they stick with the, the truth um, so that's what I that's what I kind of learnt, and it is idealistic. And of course, any cynic will immediately say, "Well, you know, the real world rolls on, the big economies, the corporations, the governments, you know, Russia. Who cares about Greta?" But um, you have to believe. I do believe, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, as an eternal optimist, that um, she's the kind of person to put your trust in, and that that's the kind of example of what we call empathy in action. Um, that actually represents the real hope for the future. Finally, the sun's coming out where I'm living. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good sign. What, uh, I'm just curious to know what you see, I mean, how, to what extent, sorry, to what extent do you feel that um, the, the fight, let's say, or the struggle that, that Greta represents and the movement that she represents, to what extent are the connections being made between the climate crisis and the global economy? Because to me, it feels like you can't address one without addressing the other. And I wonder sometimes whether that those links are being made in that movement. It's not something that I've got inside fully myself. So I wonder if you can shed any light on that. Well, <laughs> this is a very basic question do you think you can reform capitalism or do you think you're basically waiting for capitalism to collapse and then you've got to think what, what the new system is going to be that follows it um, that's I suppose the choice um, and I don't think you know, she keeps saying she's not focusing on answers she's relying on the scientists for answers what she's saying is um, please recognise the emergency and mm -hmm. she just keeps saying one very, very wonderful, simple thing. This is the amount of carbon budget we have left that we can put into the atmosphere. We're getting through it at this stage and we haven't got many years left if we go on at this rate. So either we slow down or we're going to hit very dangerous levels of warming. Not only dangerous levels, but levels that may represent a tipping point from which there's, there's no way back because there's, you know, the feedback loops will, will kick in. So I don't think she represents a political answer like you know Karl Marx or uh, Chomsky or uh, Bernie or um, um, 
a political leader or indeed an economist. I mean, there are beginnings of it. I mean, as you would have seen in the film, Kate Rayworth talks a lot about the circular economy and how that might begin to work. And she's running workshops on how that would work. And there are cities now in Holland which are actually are applying it. Um, so that is, again, trying to grow a small seed which could get into something bigger. But when you actually, as a realist, you put that great but small initiative or the Transition Towns initiative against you know, the big corporations or the big uh, global superpowers or the kind of idiocy of something like Trump, it's, it's, <laughs> you have to be a strong believer to believe that she's going to triumph this David and Goliath world the, the battle in the next mm. few decades. In other words, I think the answers are there. We, we can, I think, all begin to see the better society we want. Um, but whether the 1%, the oligarchs, I'm a, I'm a bit worried about the 1% because I'm in the 1% as a well-off person. But, you know, the, the oligarch, I'm not actually controlling the world the way the oligarchs do. Um, whether they will be dethroned or whether they will come to realise the, the error of their ways and stop pushing us all over the cliff. Um, you know, it's an open question. I, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an economist. And uh, I just think I have to put my, um, you know, I think a lot of life is about a gamble. And I love Pascal's wager. He says, you know, at the end of the day, you roll the dice and you've got to bet on, is there a meaning to things or is there not? And so I think you have to take a bet that there is a better world possible. Um, there are people showing us what it is. Thank goodness we can begin to live it now. And let's hope that it grows and has enough attractive power. And at the same time as the collapse of the, the big systems, that it can actually represent the future. But I'm mean, what... about that like everything else. <laughs> mm. Yes, it's it takes a lot of strength and clarity of vision to to stay you know adhering to one direction and one path i mean it's so easy especially with the influence of the media and social media as you referred to to kind of stay with one's feet on the ground and and yeah stay committed to a certain um future vision when there's so many conflicting messages around um if you were to share what your what systemic changes you feel the world needs most right now, or what what one systemic change, what would be up near the top of your list? Well, I mentioned one already, which is the media. There's got to be some kind of reform. We cannot have the media ownership, such powerful weapons in the hands of a few oligarchs who are not concerned about the common good to be absolutely blunt about it. We just can't survive as a society if we do that. And if ever there was a lesson for that, then it's Trump and Fox News. I mean, what a, what a, you couldn't make it up. So that's what I mentioned already, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, the other big change I think is in, is in education. Um, I'm a great, I've been very influenced by um, the writing of um, Yuval Harari. I don't know if you've read his books, but um, talking about the kind of future we're going into with automation, with um, a different relation to the natural world, um, and the fact that educating people for a fixed career within a capitalist system isn't going to be the future. And what we most need to do is to reimagine education so that the next generation um, go back to those things which, as I was talking about before, that really, that really are valuable. So they hone their intelligence, they hone their creativity, they hone their empathy, they hone their under holistic understanding of the real world, not the world as presented in the media. The, 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 uh, the wrong kind of media. Um, so, you know, the right kind of creative education, which, you know, there have been, I'm not an expert, I know there are things like the Steiner schools or the small school in the West Country, and 
more creative schools. In fact, this place where we live here used to be a school. It was um, uh, it was built in the 30s and it was used for many years as a little country school for refugees in the last war who came over. And it was, and what they were taught in the woods was things like drama and other languages and world history and openness to all kinds of creativity. So we like to think we've kept a little flavor of that in, in what we do. So I would say, you know, education There's another marvelous, just to sort of prick my own bubble a little bit. There's a wonderful cartoon in which two monks are fleeing from a whole city, which is completely in flames. It's been destroyed and the vandals have come in and destroyed the whole culture. And these two monks are fleeing. And one is saying to the other one, I think the answer is education. Um, so, uh, you know, it is a long term aim and it is a slow burn. Um, but if it's, there's one other thing that I do think is a hope for the future is the people who are thinking about how the next generation can be brought up to see the world quite, quite differently. Thank you. Yeah, so long view there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but yes. Raising, raising people to be human beings, really, rather than um, cogs in the wheel. <laughs> Absolutely. And by the way, congratulations in what you're doing. I mean, it seems like really good work with this alliance to, to bring together and look at systemic change in the way you are. So I hope that really flourishes too.